Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you could make it. Thank you very much for coming. I'm thrilled to be here. So uh, again, my name is Andy. I'm KB1OIQ from Massachusetts. I am really, truly thrilled to be here. I'm glad you're all here as well. And uh, people usually want to know, who is this person standing up in front of us, and why does he think he has a right to be here? Well, I just wanted to let you know, I haven't been in the hobby long, only since uh, '07. 7 and uh, I've enjoyed it immensely ever since. Uh, a couple of years after I joined uh, the hobby, uh, they elected me to be club president because I had been running Linux clubs since 97. Yes, sir? And you're, you're okay now. I think everything's fine now, yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, so I, I ran the club for about 10 years, had a good time with that, and got out just uh, at the end of the before time. And uh, now the gentleman who's running it's doing a great job. Uh, I took part in the section for a couple of years, helping out with different things as an assistant section manager and affiliated club coordinator. Uh, back in 97, I founded my first uh, Linux users group in Worcester, Massachusetts, uh, which is still going strongly today. Uh, we, they meet at uh, Worcester Polytechnic Institute, otherwise known as WPI, where I graduated. And uh, they still have a good core group of about 20 people that meet all the time. Uh, for quite a while there, I, uh, when I moved out of Worcester up to Chelmsford, Massachusetts, uh, I founded a Linux group there that I ran for many years and uh, also ran a meetup group until just before COVID started. And the only reason we haven't started is because I haven't gotten off my butt to do it. Uh, but we had quite a few people meeting for that. Uh, I also taught Linux courses for many years for the adult uh, education program at night. Uh, that was a lot of fun. For 150 bucks, they got two or $3,000 worth of tech support. They loved that. And uh, I've been using Linux since 1997. And uh, by day, I'm a computer engineer. I used to design digital logic circuits. And now I build computer simulations and program them to test things before they're ever fabricated. So to quite literally say I live in simulated reality is a true statement. Uh, the fact that I can change my reality with one line of code, I wish life was that easy. So my most recent interest, and this will appeal to many of you who have been in the hobby a lot longer, I'm learning how to bring antique radios back to life, uh, mostly from the 1920s and 1930s. Uh, I was not brought up during the tube era, so I know very little about that technology, but I've learned enough to know how to fix it and make it work again, so I've had fun with that. Uh, home brewing, I've always enjoyed soldering together different ham radio kits, Arduinos, that sort of thing, very much like that. I spent a lot of time doing uh, micro bit X. You might remember the gentleman from India who's been creating those for many years. Uh, at one point, I wanted to build a radio from scratch, so I did. I found a schematic for a 1920s style uh, regenerative receiver, and I hadn't played with one of those before, and I, I think they're rather elegant uh, in their simplicity, so I did that. But uh, it, as far as Linux and much more modern things go, I've been enjoying FT8, but yes, I like CW and Sideband as well. Uh, the Grid Tracker software we'll talk about later, fantastic piece of software, uh, and it runs on the three major operating systems. Uh, fox hunting I enjoy. Uh, I believe the, the folks from the M17 project are here today. Go see them if you're interested in free software digital voice. And uh, the bottom line that fell off the slide is, of course, I've been doing Andy's Ham Radio Linux for quite a number of years. How many people here have downloaded and used it at least once? A few of you. OK, well, thank you. I appreciate that. And uh, others, I hope you will consider it after this talk. So when I created Andy's Ham Radio Linux many, many years ago, I had some goals in mind. Uh, I knew a lot about the Linux community. I was learning about the Ham Radio community. And I wanted to promote Linux, number one, because I, I firmly believe in the ideals of free and open source software. Uh, I, I don't like to use proprietary proprietary software, I try not to. Um, now some people will say, well, so what if the source code's available? I'm not a programmer, I can't do anything with it. That's true, but there are millions of programmers around the world who can and who do. And when you see the collection of software that I've brought together for ham radio, all written by volunteers, people just like you and I that know how to do this, um, you'll, you'll see there's really a lot out there. So I did it to give back to the ham radio community and the Linux communities. You know, your Elmers teach you things, you wanna be the next Elmer, you wanna pay it for Forward, whatever you call that. Uh, so I want to give, this is my way of giving back to both of those communities. Um, I wanted to create a software collection containing as much ham radio software as I could find and I could fit, where none of it is proprietary. It's all free and open source or similarly uh, licensed software. Uh, and the goal, and you never quite hit this with any computer, the goal is it just works. All right, we have enough computers to fiddle with. We've got our cell phones, we've got this computer, we've got that computer, the, the radio's a computer, which you typically can't get into. I want it to just work. 
Now, if some program crashes, okay, I, I can't do a whole lot about that. But when I pull it together, I need to make sure it's installed correctly. I need to make sure all the menus work. You don't want to fiddle with that stuff. You just want to bring up the program and enjoy the radio. That's my goal. Only you folks can tell me if I accomplished it, right? But yes, I run my own stuff too. So if I see something, I will fix it. Um, and so I want to focus on the radio hobby, not babysitting yet another computer. So the idea of Andy's Ham Radio Linux started out just that way many years ago. So two weeks and a day ago, I released version 25A. Um, you can tell I'm not a marketing person, I'm an engineer, so I'm just numbering things sequentially. And uh, when I checked last night at the hotel, there were 630 downloads of that software in about 15 days. Thank you, I appreciate the support. Um, I could create this all day, and if nobody downloaded it, it wouldn't mean anything. So I'm, I'm thankful that lots of people download it and at least try it, and I hope some of you use it regularly. Um, you can download the ISO file from the SourceForge website. Uh, be sure to check the MD5 sum on it to make sure that you've got a clean, you know, uncorrupted download because that causes some very strange problems. Uh, if you're not sure where to find it, uh, go to SourceForge.net and uh, search for my call sign, Kilo Bravo One Oscar India Quebec, and uh, or you can look for just Andy's Ham Radio Linux and you'll find it. Uh, as I said, all of the software is covered by the GNU General Public License or some other similar uh, free software license. And uh, you know, how can you get started with this? Uh, some people have an older computer that they're not using for Windows or some other operating system like that. And they often will try it before they send that computer to recycling. And that's a good way to do it. You were going to get rid of the computer anyway. Why not try it? Be careful when you start getting 10 and 12 years old. Some of the processors didn't have the instructions that many software-defined radio programs need, so those programs might not work. But by and large, it'll work. You can kick the tires and see how you like it. Um, so one way to do it is get the ISO file, put it on a thumb drive, and, uh, or, or just take the ISO file and boot it up in VirtualBox. That's an open source tool that works on the major operating systems. Try it out. It's fully functional. Yes, it's a little slower on VirtualBox, but it works, so give it a try. And if you decide you like it, then create a bootable thumb drive and uh, install it to your hard drive or SSD or whatever you have. And, uh, I'm going to say this about three times today because you'd be surprised how many people don't do it. And I don't quite want to say RTFM, but please read the Getting Started document. There's one wart of a bug in there that I wish would go away and it won't. And I've had no less than a dozen emails about it. Please read the document. I wouldn't have wasted your time writing it if it wasn't necessary. So the target computer that you can use, pretty much any computer that's not more than 10 years old will run most of this software. Certainly something newer will be even better. Uh, you've got to have at least four gigabytes of memory today. That's nothing. If you have more, that's okay. Uh, when the installation is finished, it will take about 20 gigabytes of memory, or I'm sorry, of disk space. Um, the installer might get mad at you if you have less than 64 gigabytes, but either way, that's Nobody should have any problem with that unless they're running some really old computer. Uh, by and large, processor speed is not an issue. Okay, the exception to that would be like a software-defined radio program, which by its nature is compute-bound. Okay, but a logging piece of program or something else like that, those are not compute-bound processes, so you won't have a real issue there. Not sure what that was. Um, networking, wired or wireless, pretty much everybody has wireless these days. and. Uh, Back many, many years ago when computers had DVDs, you could install from that, but pretty much nobody has those anymore. So you do need USB to do your installation. And again, that shouldn't be a problem for people. So when you boot it up, let's say you boot it up in VirtualBox, you'll get a screen that looks very much like this. Uh, you'll see a couple of icons down the side. You'll see a, a panel of sorts down at the bottom. And your, your background screen is there. And so if you get to that point, you know you're in good. And so, did I happen to say that you should please read the Getting Started Guide? Please? <laughs> okay. It, it's, it's amazing how many folks don't read that. And there's, there's one pain in the neck problem that I have not been able to fix, and I don't think it's in my software. Um, so, you, you boot this thing up, you double click the icon that says install, you answer some questions. It's the standard Ubuntu installer. I've done nothing to customize it except change the slideshow that you see while you're doing it, assuming you sit there and watch it. So when you, when you do it, it'll ask you, do you want to continue? Do you want to reboot? Uh, what I recommend now is reboot it. And you'll get a screen that looks like this that says other. And this is where the trouble starts. And I really wish I knew how to fix this bug. 
The trouble starts because in the installation process, it asks you for a username and password, and you naturally expect it's going to create the account you asked for. It doesn't. Why does it work for Ubuntu and not for me? Darned if I know. And if I knew how to fix it, I would, but I don't. So what you do here is you log in with the default name xUbuntu, in lowercase letters. Hit enter a couple of times without using a password, and then you'll get in. And so the instructions are written here. Once you're in, bring up a terminal window, type a couple of commands that are described in the document. It will create the account for you with the username you desire. And more importantly, it adds your user account to about 12 different groups that are required by different pieces of software. That information is not easy to find in one place. So I've put it there for you in that script. So if, for example, you have a, a laptop or some computer that's in a, a Radio Shack that's shared by your club, you might want to add lots of different accounts to that. So just use the script that I've created, and then you know everybody's account will be created correctly, it will have the right groups and so forth, and it'll, it'll all just work, which again was the goal. You do it exactly once for every account that you want to create on the machine. Now most of you, it'll be just your machine in your shack, you do it once, you're done. You never have to worry about this again. To me, that's easy, but many people have had problems with that, largely because they just, they just didn't read the doc. So after that, when you log out and log back in, if your username is Andy, that's what it's going to say. Whatever your username is, that's what should appear there. Then you give it the password that you told it, and you're in. So I don't know in the back if you can read all the text of those menus. If you can't, don't worry about it. It's not meant to be an eye chart. I just didn't realize the physical dimensions of this room and, and the font sizes and whatnot. Um, but what I wanted to do is at a high level, just give you a feel for the types of software that's in there. There's a lot of it. And of course, I can't go through every line. That would bore you. I don't want to do that. But I want to give you for a feel for just how much is in there. And uh, I had to cut back a little bit because SourceForge says no files bigger than six gigabytes. And for the longest time, I was around 3.8 to four gigabytes, and that would fit on a four gigabyte thumb drive. These days, the thumb drives are much bigger, so that's not an issue. But uh, I had to cut out some stuff to make sure that it fit within about five gigabytes. Uh, most people have you know, cable modem or, or some other you know, fast internet technology. Uh, and, and so you know, Fios, uh, they, they might have something like that. Uh, and so downloading something of that size often isn't a problem. Uh, for those of you who might not have a fast internet like that, send me an email. I have been known to make thumb drives and mail them to people. I've only done it five or six times, but I will do it if, if that's what's needed, because I want people to try this. Uh, and in one case, I mailed a pre-configured laptop to a gentleman in Texas, and he used it for quite a while. That, that's extraordinary, but I did it, because I got the laptop for free. Um, but uh, he used it. He had a lot of fun with it, so I was happy to do it. So you'll see lots of menus there. If you look on the right of that big box, there's all kinds of menus there, accessories and Andy's Ham Radio Linux and so on and so forth. And all of those menus are managed by the system. Ubuntu and whatever tools they've installed, XFCE and whatnot, manage all of those menus except, guess which one? The one that says Andy's Ham Radio Linux. That's the one that I put in and configured for all of you based on my idea of how these things should be organized. So if that menu and its submenus have a problem, talk to me. I'll fix it. If the other submenus, like there is one of those menus that says ham radio, I didn't do it. Um, so I mean, there are ways to customize it, but I, I didn't do those. And so I, it's not really something I can fix. Because uh, in this case, I didn't rewrite all of this. This isn't Gen 2. This is built on top of Ubuntu Linux. And you know, when you stand on the shoulders of giants, you're going to, you know, sometimes one of the pillars is a little crumbly. But this isn't too bad. So if you notice on the left-hand side that you may or may not be able to read, there's all kinds of groups of software. There's antenna software. There's software for CW. There's digital mode software. Uh, there's quite a bit of documentation on there. For those of you who are into designing your own circuit boards and doing layouts or doing Arduino or rolling your own coils and that sort of thing, there's all kinds of electronic design software in there to assist that aspect of the hobby. Um, HF propagation, there's quite a few tools in there, and a couple. there's a web link for for uh, VOA cap, for example. It used to be a standalone program. Now it's all done on the internet. 
Uh, you'll see there's quite a few different logging programs on there. Uh, there's a lot of uh, Dave Freeze, W1HKJ, FL Digi, and what I affectionately call the FL family of software. FL Digi, FL Amp, FL Message, all of those, they're all in there. And a small subset of those are referred to as uh, NBEMS, the MCOM folks when they know that one, Net Narrow Band Emergency message system, I believe that stands for. And so I don't know if that's all the programs related to that, but if they're not in that menu, they're on the system somewhere else. And I'm, I'm happy to enhance that menu going forward if it's deficient. Um, rig control software, there's quite a few pieces of rig control software that are in there that will probably help you. Uh, as well as satellite stuff. Uh, if you happen to have a yard where you've got a clear view to the sky, not like mine, which is full of trees and leaves and I can't see the sky, which is a good thing, but not for satellites. Um, there's quite a bit of software in there for satellites, such as the Fox Telemetry program that AMSAT puts out. Uh, there's an installed version in there for you. Click the menu, it comes up, you configure it, off you go. And then last but not least, there's quite a few pieces of software to find radio software in there. It's hard to put all of that on here because there are so many pieces of software that are specific to a particular uh, hardware box that you would buy. So I tried to put big stuff in there in the hope that it covers most of the bases, but there, there may be something missing there depending on which piece of software, I'm sorry, which piece of hardware you have. So I tried. Okay, let me take a quick breath here. Does anybody have any questions up to this point? Hmm, sir in the back. Did I include Chirp? Yes, I did. Yes, it, question, sir. Winlink is proprietary software, as far as I know, sir, and I don't have any proprietary software in here. How about? I'm not familiar with that piece of software. Let's talk after. A couple more. Have I ever ported? Have I ever ported it to ARM? No, I have not. But Ubuntu itself has been ported to ARM. So if these programs compile on an ARM architecture, it should work. But no, I've never done it. So I'll take one more question. Anybody? Yes, sir. Okay. I've been asked this question before. Many people will say, "I have X Ubuntu or Linux Mint or whatever flavor of Linux already running. How do I?" augment that to make it look like Andy's Ham Radio Linux. And unless you have a list of the software that I've put on, that's the only way to do it, and it's a manual process. There's no uh, automated way that I know of. But in fact, on the, uh, the software collection, there is a list of the software that I have on there. So you could go through the process of installing those things and get something close. So you don't have a filter kit or anything where you can sit there and say, build? No, I don't. I do it the good old-fashioned way. New England Crafts dot slash configure make make install when I have to if it's in Ubuntu's repository of course I'll take it but sometimes that repository is a bit out of date and I haven't gotten to the point yet where I want to run my own PPA for this which I could do All right okay let me move on a little bit here good questions from everybody so I know lots of people like to customize their, their backgrounds and other aspects of their computer, and Linux makes that quite simple. Uh, but to many people, the, the idea of configuring everything is a complexity that they would rather not have. For some of us, we're control freaks. We want it to be a very particular way, and, and I resemble that statement. And once you get it, you're, you're good to go. So one of the things I did is I found some uh, background patterns that were uh, Creative Commons license or other you know, open license that you can uh, put these on and distribute them. So if you don't like the Penguin background or you just want something different, I've put some uh, software in there. If you right click on the desktop and hit, uh, I believe it's desktop settings, you'll get a menu like this and you can pick a background or download your own, put it in the right place. Place and you can make this look any way you want. So there's quite a bit of documentation on there. Some of it are documents that I wrote that were helpful. I figured out how to do, what was it, Digital Radio Mundial, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. And it's not a common thing that people use, but I wanted to make that software work. I figured it out, I wrote it down. Hopefully that helps somebody. Uh, but there's many other pieces of documentation. I, I don't try to reproduce the whole internet in this software collection. So what I would say to you is, if you have trouble with a piece of software, first and foremost, go to the website for that piece of software 
software, they can probably answer your question better than I can. But if you ask me and I know, of course, I'll share that with you. Um, some of the programs are command line based. Yeah, believe it or not. And so the documentation for many of those is a man page. Well, some people don't know about those because they're not as familiar with Linux. So I put many of those in their own menu, which brings up a terminal window, runs man, brings up the documentation. But most of it is online. Uh, you can click through you know, HTML just like you would, you would expect it to be, and uh, you can find it that way. So there's lots of different pages there. Um, under documentation, there's command line documents. There's uh, Andy's Ham Radio, the, the stuff that I created. There's uh, the documentation for, uh, for Dave's stuff, W1HKJ. And uh, also, I think I have the Direwolf stuff in there. Yes, I do. Uh, I know John, WB2OSZ. He's a member of the ham radio club that I belong to in Massachusetts. He lives right down the street from me. And uh, I put some of his documents in here for the Direwolf software. OK, this is an eye chart. Don't try to read this, but it's a long list of the different uh, pieces of documentation that I wrote for Andy's Ham Radio Linux. Uh, included in that and, and of note is uh, the release notes, uh, all of the versions of the different software that I have put in here in case you're interested in that. Uh, the Getting Started Guide is in there somewhere. It's also on SourceForge. And uh, the list of packages that were installed uh, through the Ubuntu Package Manager, APT. Um, it's, it's all there. And you'll notice some of this documentation will bring up a terminal window. Some of it will bring up a website. In this case, it brings up a website with, with Firefox of all the files. You click it, you've got it. It's right there. OK, um, I'm not going to be able to go through all the menus line by line. Again, I don't want to put you to sleep, even though I hope you've had your coffee before you came here. But, but uh, just to give you an idea, so off on the left-hand side, you may or may not be able to read it. Uh, there's some antenna software in there. There's, there's three or four. I lost my, did I lose the mic? Oh. Hello. Take two. Hell. Can you hear me back there? Okay, I'll try that until the AV gentleman is able to come in here and fix this. I don't know what happened. It's a Windows machine. I couldn't begin to tell you. Uh, <laughs> So, so uh, what I wanted to let you know is that I've got a collection of uh, antenna-related software in there. Uh, one program that I wrote, how many people have Rig Expert AA-whatever analyzers? A few of us. Okay, the older versions, before they did Zoom, I wrote the software for Linux on that to extract the data out of there. Thank you, Rig Expert, for providing the specification so I could do that. Because as you probably know, most of these vendors create proprietary software that doesn't help us Linux people at all, and they largely don't care. When I contacted Rig Expert many, many years ago, they said, sure, we'll tell you the goes into's and goes out of's, but we don't want to tell you the internal stuff. I said, I'm fine with that. And so I was able to write that piece of software. It's a Perl script. It's not fancy. It gets the data in and out. Feed it to your favorite spreadsheet or whatever you want to do with it. It is available. OK. Other things that are in there. Uh, how many people know what a Moxon rectangle antenna is? A few of you. If you ever want to build one, there is a piece of software that I wrote called FL Moxgen. It looks very much like the Windows version that somebody wrote many, many years ago, but it's a complete rewrite. All that's the same is the GUI. And I asked the gentleman for permission to copy that GUI. Strictly speaking, I didn't need it because it's not copyrighted or anything, but I asked him, you know, because we hams tried to be ladies and gentlemen to each other, and he said, sure, no problem. So many years ago, I wrote that program. You can print the PDF file, you can take it to your garage or your workshop, wherever you build these things, and you've got it made. And with any luck and a little bit of that spray that makes the SWR go down, it'll work fantastically. Right? <laughs> <laughs> There's a vendor here today that's selling it, right? <laughs> yep. Um, RF exposure. I believe the requirements to do that kicked in this month in May. And so there's a, a one, there's probably several places to go for that. There's one website that I have linked to here. You type in the gain of your antenna, the frequency, and two or three other things. And before you know it, it's printing out something about controlled exposure, uncontrolled exposure, how many feet away. You need to save that documentation. Print it and put it in a file cabinet somewhere for every antenna that you have on every frequency it runs on. FCC says we must do this. And unfortunately, there are litigious people out there that don't appreciate our high hobby. Cover yourselves. Make sure you have that. You know you're not supposed to hurt anybody with your RF emissions, and, and we don't, but we still sometimes have to prove it. So make sure you have those things handy. If you change an antenna, rerun re that analysis. It takes five minutes. It's a one-page printout, and you save it. And then you're covered. 
right? You can say you did the analysis. Um, uh, there's FL Moxgen real quick. It's a very, oops, oh dear. Are you all right, sir? Yeah. Okay. Okay, there we go. Glad you're okay. So real quick, there's the GUI for FL MoxGen. Again, I'm an engineer. I don't, I don't do fancy stuff. It's, it's, I want, I want the, the, the function, not the form so much. But it does the job. You type in a few numbers. Uh, you get the antenna that you want. It, you can print it. And on top of that, it will create the correct file for XNEC2C so you can do antenna analysis on it because the format of that file is kind of ugly. And it's a bit arcane because the program was written in the days of uh, punch cards. And so nobody wants to go through, well, it was, but the code works. So we just needed a new user interface, and somebody did that. And so you can see what the user interface looks like for it today. Uh, keying in the information is a little tedious, but it's there. And so you can get a picture of the Moxon rectangle antenna in the vertical orientation. This is for two meters. You get the, uh, the, the graph in the middle, the, the picture in the middle that shows what the radiation antenna pattern looks like. And then you get your front to back gain and SWR and all that in the, in the diagram on the left. The software can do a lot more than that, but that's what I did just for the demo, just to show you what's in there. Um, okay, um, other things that are in there. Uh, CW and fox hunting. How many people have done fox hunting in the past? A few of you? I do it. Uh, have you ever engaged in the treachery of fox hunting by telling other people it's that way when it's really this way? No, we've never done that, right? <laughs> <laughs> and and, and you, you, we all know this here, I'm sure, but you don't have to know CW to find the fox. You just have to be able to track a signal. Um, this is not working. If you could tell someone. Thank you, sir. Oh, okay. Very good, sir. Thank you. I'll just yell. Um, so um, uh, the, the MicroFox device from Bionics, that's the second company that offered me assistance when I asked them how to program their devices, and they said absolutely positively, yes, here's the specification you need. Thank you, Bionics. I really do appreciate that. So the, the GUI looks, again, just like the GUI for the Windows program that they distribute. I had to give it a slightly different name because I don't want people calling them for support on my software. That's not fair to them. And so it's all here. And you, you, if you program it with this program, yes, it's still compatible with the way the Windows program programs it. It's all good. Um, there's also a program in there for CW practice, XCWCP. It's an old program, but it works. If you need practice uh, with CW, you hear the sound, write it down, compare it to what's on the screen, piece of cake. Uh, I used that and uh, L, there we go, thank you. I used that in LCWO.net. Uh, I always run that a month before field day so I can get, you know, because I, I can't do CW at a very high speed, but some of those people send the call signs at 30 words a minute, and I would want to at least pull that out so I can help the guys on the CW station. So uh, there's programs in there for that. Uh, the next menu, digital modes. There's an awful lot of stuff in the digital modes menu. I'm not going to cover all of it, but all of the FL programs are in there from Dave W1HKJ. Uh, there's a free DV. How many people have heard of free DV, digital voice for amateur radio, free software? Excellent. Yeah. The, the Codec 2 that the gentleman in Australia wrote perhaps 10 years ago, that's still an active effort because every day they get it down to a lower and lower bit rate which is very amenable to, to HF, for example. We want to keep the, the amount of RF spectrum that we use relatively narrow. Now, sure, there's a decrease in audio quality when you do that, but now we're getting down to communications grade. You can hear the words. You know what's said, but some of the tonal qualities of the speaker might be lost unless you have a really good channel between the two. So there's, a, there's that stuff out there. Um, grid Tracker is out there. How many people have ever used Grid Tracker? Quite a few. I think it's a most excellent piece of software. Thank you, Steve Loomis and company. Uh, that's, that's great stuff if you're into tracking your grids for whatever reason. Um, there's uh, the, P, uh, the, the uh, what do you call it, WSJ, what is it, WSJTX, the FT8 software is in there. Uh, and that's a good piece of software that you'll be familiar with. An offshoot of that is JS8 Call. How many people have heard of that one? A few of you. Thank you, Jordan and company. They did a great job with that software. Um, JTDX is in there. Uh, there's some M17 software. How many people have heard of the M17 project? It's not a military weapon. It's digital stuff for ham radio. I believe the M17 people are here today. Several of them are in southern New Hampshire, and I've met them personally. I'm very excited about that project, and I'm starting to participate in it and learn a lot more about uh, free digital modes in, well, not, not free digital modes, but free digital voice in ham radio. 
Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Um, other things that are in there, there's the, uh, uh, the Echo Link software is in there called QTEL. There's a much older program in there called Zaster. I don't know how many people have heard of Zaster. It draws maps of all different flavors. You can use APRS to get data on the maps. It's a very good piece of software. There's a lot to it. It's in there for you. It was very difficult to configure with all the map formats and everything. I've done all that for you. Just click the button. Use it. I think you'll have fun. And uh, there's another program in there. Uh, I can't read them all. They're too small for me even. But there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. So how many people have, uh, you can admit it here. It's OK. We're all friends. How many people have done FT8 before and maybe even like it? I do. I admit it. But I like other stuff in the hobby too. And so this piece of software, WSJTX by uh, Joe Taylor and friends, uh, is out there. It runs on the three major operating systems. And uh, this ties in very nicely with Grid Tracker. So whatever grids you get, it will plot them on the map, and you can see what you've got, what's been QSL'd, and so forth. Uh, and how many people have ever heard of the relatively simple logger called Xlog? A few of you. I'm the current maintainer of Xlog. I hardly ever have to do anything with it. But it's been around for, oh, close to 20 years. Uh, a gentleman in uh, the Netherlands wrote it originally. And many years ago, he said, I'm done with this. I don't want to write it anymore. If with anybody who has the credentials, wants to take this over, send me an email. So I sent him an email and said, OK, I don't know the innards of your software, but I am a programmer, so on and so forth. Uh, I'd like to give it a try. And six weeks later, I heard nothing. I figured, OK, somebody else got it. Well, then he sends me an email back. He says, Andy, I think you have the credentials, and nobody else has asked. It's yours. So I hope that's a good thing, right? I hope it is. So I have put in some fixes. And the first fix I put in is a question mark that says, do you want to ask the question, are you sure you want to quit? I hate that thing. But in fairness, we want to keep choices available. So if you like that, you can keep that option. If you don't like it, you check it once. You never see it again, OK? And so that's the first modification, I don't want to say fix, modification that I put into that software. Typically, I'm updating it as the ADIF spec changes. I want to keep the ADIF output compatible with you know, Logbook of the World, EQSL, and so forth. So I try to keep up with that spec. So uh, as I mentioned, Grid Tracker is an excellent piece of software. You can use it. You don't have to use it just for FT8. But, but many people do. Uh, if you're into six meters and you're chasing the Fred Fish Award and you want to track your grids, you could use this software for that. No problem at all. It talks to WSJTX. It also talks to Xlog. I put that capability in there. So when you're, when you're using WSJTX and Grid Tracker and Xlog all at once, I hope you have a big monitor, it will automatically put your QSOs in Xlog. You won't lose them. So in that configuration, your QSOs are probably stored in about three different files. But at least they're there. You won't lose them. Uh, Grid Tracker also will send your logs to Logbook of the World, EQSL, I think QRZ. There's five or six different places that you can configure where Grid Tracker will send your logs. And then it'll read back from them as well. So it'll change the color of the square. And I'll show you that. Uh, hopefully, you can see that picture OK. There's all kinds of colored rectangles on there. And they mean different things. Some of them are, I contacted that grid. Uh, I got a QSL back from that grid. And if there's nothing there, it means you've never gotten that grid. Now, this may look a little bit sparse, but that's what I've accomplished. Some people have large swaths of the world you know, totally covered. They've gotten all the grids. It's whatever you do. Uh, lots of other things on this uh, screenshot. You may not be able to see all of it, but there's a spot there that tells you where is all the activity right now. And on this one, it says it's mostly on 20 meters. How does it figure that out? It talks to PSK Reporter. The gentleman who wrote that lives down the street from me. And uh, so that's a great tool as well. I don't know that I mention it here, but it's, it's good stuff. Uh, and then down at the bottom, of course, it shows you who's calling CQ or configure it to show you anything you want. Mine is configured to say who's calling CQ from a grid that I need or have not confirmed. And so I can see down there, there's three of them. Two are grids that I need. One is, is highlighted as a grid that I've contacted but not confirmed. And if I want to in FT8, I can click that, and it will start the, uh, the uh, conversation. Uh, next menu down is uh, one with all the electronic design stuff in it. And uh, uh, the, how many people have programmed with Arduinos in the past? 
quite a few. Okay, Arduino relatively recently came out with a whole new interface, 2 dot, 2 dot asterisk, and this has that new software on there. It's 2.1 now. Uh, as far as I can tell, it reads in all your old files just fine, no issue with it. They've made some changes to the GUI and, and perhaps the libraries and whatnot. That's all in here for you. That, that's a big hunk of software to, to fit in here, but it's, it's in there for you. Uh, other pieces of software that are in there, uh, there's all kinds of stuff for doing uh, circuit boards. You can draw schematics, you can create the Gerber files that you would send to a vendor. All of that kind of stuff is in here. Now, maybe most of us don't do that, but those of you who do, it's all right here for you. KiCad is in there and, and so forth. So there's the Arduino GUI. In some ways, it doesn't look much different. In other ways, it's quite a bit different. But I just found some, some program I had laying around to load in there. Still does the syntax highlighting and, and all of that stuff. I found, well, the older version, 1.8, I found that highly valuable when I was hacking the MicroBitX code. Uh, you may, may remember Ashar Farhan from India and the MicroBitX effort that's been ongoing for years. Um, I took a MicroBitX and hacked the living daylights out of the software and did a, a major hardware hack. I put an Emic 2 chip in there, and I think I have the only MicroBitX that talks to you. And so a blind person could use it. And in fact, I had a blind person test drive it for me. He, he says, you got, I, I mean, I'm sighted. I don't know what it's like to be a blind person. <clears throat> and he said that I pretty much nailed it. So I only built two of them because they were expensive to build in, in quantity one. But, but I have them, and they do work. I put all of that information on SourceForge. So if anybody ever wanted to duplicate it, they could. Unfortunately, the Emic 2 chip is EOL. So I don't think you can get that anymore. But there might be one floating around uh, at the flea market, perhaps. You never know. Okay, uh, how many people ever wind their own coils and make their own projects that way? A few of you do. Um, you can get close with software like this as to how many turns you need, how thick is your wire, how thick is your form, so on and so forth. But there's always the adding or subtracting of a couple of turns to get it dialed right in. Uh, I have experienced this, and uh, it's, it's not frustrating. It just takes a little bit of, of, of work, and, and the reward is well worth it. So here's a piece of software that I found where you can feed in a lot of those parameters, and it will give you an idea of how many turns you need and uh, what the resulting inductance will be. Of course, you have to build it, measure it, but at least you have a fighting chance. Um, and I don't know what this is a schematic of, but uh, this is a, an example of what KiCad is able to do for you. It's very full-featured schematic editor. I did that about 40 years ago when I started my career in digital design. We drew them all out this way. Now it's all software that's synthesized and everything else. But many people still draw schematics for certain projects, and it's great that there's free and open source software available so that we can do this. OK, another menu that's in there is uh, HF propagation. So there's quite a few programs on there that will assist you in trying to figure out uh, HF propagation, what is the likelihood of contacting some part of the world from your part of the world, what time of day, what frequency, and so forth. And yeah, it's all a, a guess. It's all based on probability. But uh, it helps to know that you at least have a fighting chance to do something like that. So a couple of programs I found. The top one you'll recognize. I don't, it's not a program. It's an image that a gentleman uh, distributes. And he gave me permission to include that here. It has all kinds of information about uh, solar flux indices and, and the, whether bands are open or closed, how likely they are to you know, be good propagation or bad, and so forth. And if you click in the menu, you'll get that to come up. But it does not update dynamically. So if you, if you need it to be that accurate you know, every couple, three, four hours, load another one and uh, you'll get the most accurate information. Uh, down below is a fairly simple program called QGrid. You type in your grid, you type in the other person's grid, it'll give you latitude, longitude, tell you which way to aim your rotator, and, and so forth. And uh, that, that's a way to do that. Uh, another way is to buy the rotator that has the, the touch screen on it. I'm forgetting the name of the vendor. Uh, and you can just touch the map, and it'll move the antenna right around there, and, and you're good to go. Uh, nice piece of hardware. Uh, VOA cap. How many people have had experience with VOA cap? Probably quite a few of you. Uh, it used to be a standalone program on Linux, and I distributed it that way for quite a number of years. And later, they stopped uh, doing that, and they made it all web-based. So when you click the menu item here, it brings up Firefox. It brings you to that page. And then you can go forth and, and set it up to do uh, whatever prediction you would like it to do. Uh, Xlog. Yes, that's an old screenshot from 2010. It hasn't changed. There's no reason to. It's a very simple logger. It doesn't have a lot of glitz or flash or anything like that. 
It doesn't need to. Um, you can see it, it does basic logging. Uh, I say for casual logging, but I know the keyboard shortcut, so I have used it for field day. I have used it for 13 colonies. Over 2,000 calls a week are logged in this when I do 13 colonies for Massachusetts. Um, it's there. It's not nearly as fancy as the next one, uh, CQR log, with which you may be familiar. Uh, this one has a database as the back end, uh, whereas the other one is a flat text file, which is problematic because it's not so flexible, but it's easy to fix with Emacs or your favorite editor if you make a mistake. And so, oh, are there VI users here? I'm sorry, I didn't mean to offend you. Okay, a couple. <laughs> but you're a Linux user, you're forgiven, sir. <laughs> Okay, oh, the next menu is the NBeam stuff, and that is the narrowband emergency messaging system. In that menu, I have FLAMP, FL Digi, and the Silfeed email tool, which does tie into that quite nicely. Other email tools might, I know that one does. If there are other programs that are part of this suite, tell me. I'll add the menu item for it. Um, not a problem. But uh, there's no infrastructure required. Um, these programs run on other operating systems too. Uh, I have always bristled at the name WinLink. And those folks have a right to write the software in any language they want. They have a right to use their hobby time any way they want. They have a right to license their software any way they want. But unfortunately, it excludes those of us who don't run Windows. I don't think that's what this hobby is about, excluding people. So in my personal opinion, I would rather run free and open source software that's open to everybody and anybody. That's my personal preference. But again, those folks have every right to do what they're doing. And a lot of people like their stuff, and they run it. So that's OK, too. Um, so you know, people in the MCOM world will either be using this or WinLink as the two major ones. I don't know if there's another player in that space or not. Um, but this stuff is available for people who would like to use it. Uh, the next menu coming down is some rig control software, and someone asked me earlier if Chirp was included in that, and yes, it is, but I don't have a Chirp screenshot, because of course when it comes up, it's very bland. And once you do a couple of menu items, you get the, uh, the thing that looks like a spreadsheet, you fill in the blanks, hit the button, and it programs your radio very, very nicely. Uh, it works really well. Uh, I've used it on both newer radios and some very old stuff. Works just fine. I've not had a problem with it. Uh, be sure to check on their website the supported hardware list. Every HT in the world is not supported, but a large number of them are. Yours probably is. If not, and you ask them, they might just need help doing it. Uh, and so if you have that time and ability, please give them a hand. It just makes it better for everybody. Uh, one program I learned about, and the author sent me an email and said, Andy, I've got this program. Would you distribute it with AHRL? And I said, if it's free and open source and it's not a piece of junk, I absolutely will. And he didn't take umbrage at that. He understood I wanted to keep the quality of the software collection high. And that's a tribute to all of you who have written all those programs. I just tied it together. You folks are at the programs. But this is a program called WFView. And if you have an ICOM 7300 or 7610, I've had both, uh, you can get a waterfall display and control an awful lot of what you see on that front display. You can control it all here. Not every bell and whistle, of course, because our radios have so many of them these days, but you can control a good number of them. And the gentleman continues to add uh, supported models to that software. Uh, the Fox Telemetry program, how many people, AMSAT, Fox Telem, have ever downloaded and used this before? I don't see, I see a couple of hands. Okay, if you were to get into satellites, if you buy yourself an aero antenna or make your own or do something like that, uh, a program like this could be helpful uh, for the Fox satellite. You can download telemetry information and other things about the satellite, and there's a way to feed that back to AMSAT so that they always have an idea <clears throat> of how healthy the satellite is and, and so forth. Um, you might get a reading in your part of the world that says something. Other folks might not be able to read that information for whatever reason. Reason. G Predict. How many people have ever used G Predict? I've used it many times. I think it's a nice piece of software. You configure it for the satellites of interest. You can play games with the graphics there. You can make that map fully large or, or whatever you want to do. I think it's a nice map. It shows you uh, in, in the circle, in the grayed area around the satellite. You think of it like a flashlight beam from the satellite. What part of the Earth does it, does it see? And if you're inside of that circle, you have a fighting chance of communicating with that satellite. Now, if you're on the edge of the circle, it might be 10 
degrees above the horizon. You, you might not get that. In my area, there's a lot of trees. I can't get that. Uh, if you live in a flatter part of the world, you might just get away with it. But as it comes overhead, you'll almost certainly get it. Even I can get it you know, from, from here to here uh, for a short time, even with the leaves and everything. So uh, it's nice. And it will tell you, like in this case, it says, when is the next SO50? Well, OK, that's kind of a dated slide. But it will show you on that polar plot where the satellite is, where it's going. If you're aiming your antenna manually, you have a fighting chance of aiming in the right part of the sky. Uh, sure, these days there's apps on your phone and so forth that'll do it, but this is a way to do it. And built into G-Predict is a way to control your satellite rotator. If it's one of the supported rotators, it will aim the antenna for you, which takes a lot of the, the tough part out of it, and then you can just focus on making contacts. Uh, when I was doing this, I recorded all of my contacts because I was a new call sign in that satellite, so they were all jumping all over me, and I couldn't remember them all. I couldn't write it down fast enough. So thankfully, I recorded it, and replaying 12 minutes of audio wasn't uh, so onerous as I added it to the log. Uh, amusing story. I lived in Chelmsford, Massachusetts at the time, and two towns away was Nashua, New Hampshire. And my first satellite contact was with a gentleman in Nashua, New Hampshire. It's just how the waves went that day. You know, and I got a nice card from the gentleman, by the way. I still have it. So a uh, software-defined radio. How many people have heard of GNU Radio Companion? Quite a few. OK, I probably will not do the software the justice that it deserves, but I will try. Um, it's, it, you can use it for software-defined radio, but for any signal processing application, you can describe it graphically and connect the boxes quite literally, set the parameters for each box. How wide or narrow do you want the filter? Do you want tight skirts or wide ones or whatever you want? You can set all of those in software. And when you have it, you push the Go button, and it writes a bunch of Python code and executes it for you. You never have to touch Python. You don't need to know anything about it. And it will run your application. And one common example is plug in your RTLSDR device or whatever you have. Um, there's things that you can download or find where you can draw a picture of an AM radio receiver or an FM radio receiver and try it. And if that works, say, okay, the system as a whole is working. Now I could potentially do something much more sophisticated with it. And so that's what I encourage you to do. Now here, you, don't worry about reading all the details. It's a block diagram connected by lines. And one of them is an audio sync, which means it comes out the speakers. One of them is a box that represents your RTL SDR or hack RF or whatever device you have, and all the rest in between is the digital signal processing. And it's, it's a very sophisticated, very nice piece of software. Uh, this is a quick program that I hacked together. I do not know a lot of details of how to use this software, but very quickly I hacked together an FM radio receiver, got it to draw that fancy graph at the bottom and the, and the, the waterfall on top. And it, on the top there's a drop down menu with four local stations. And so I said when I pick you know, uh, WABC, whatever the station is, uh, it will switch to that frequency, I will hear it, and it all works. And it works quite well actually, even with a cheap uh, uh, dongle for software defined radio. Uh, GQRX, who's played with that software before? It's a nice piece of software. I don't think it's changed much lately, but it doesn't need to. It's mature software. Uh, you can hook it up to a, a software-defined radio device such as an RTL SDR. You might recognize that frequency as NOAA weather radio. And so you can tell it if it's an AM transmission, an FM, narrow, wide, whatever the band is. You get the nice, both the waterfall and, and the other graph here, and you can tell. because. In almost any part of the country, they've got four or five of these stations broadcasting. You're bound to get one of them. Sometimes you can get two or three of them. And so not just for NOAA Weather Radio, but anything that's out there that is in the frequency range of your, of your dongle, um, you could do that. Um, here's a program that to me is relatively new. I have not used it before called SDR Angel. Uh, it appears to be a fairly complex uh, piece of software, very sophisticated, has a lot of capability. Uh, I put it on there for all of you to use, but also it's one of the early programs that has M17 support. So if you're interested in M17, this might be a way to go about it. So what do I think is new and cool? Well, we talked about free digital voice a little while ago, uh, David Rowe, uh, VK5, DJR uh, created that about 10 years ago with his helpers, and they've continued to enhance it. Somebody put a GUI on it called FreeDV, which is in here, which you could use. 14.2 uh, 
I think it's 230 is the frequency that they use for those sorts of communications. And uh, they also have a place on the internet where you can set up a SCED and chat with people. Uh, but the M17 project is a little different. Uh, that's a fairly new project, perhaps the last year or so. And what they're doing is they're taking Codec 2, which is the name of the coder encoder uh, that David Rowe and company created, and they're layering protocols on top of that that can be used by application writers to create applications that support M17. So Codec 2 is a free and open source, open source voice encoder decoder. Say that three times fast. Um, it, 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 you can see the source code, you can do it. Now, why aren't these things more prevalent? This man has a PhD in the subject, and he's been writing this software. It's widely believed that his thesis work is the prior art protecting him from patents. Okay, no one has ever challenged it in court. But all of these other proprietary modes, DMR and DSTAR and, and Fusion and all these other things, they're all proprietary and none of them talk to each other. That fragments the community. We saw this in Unix 50, 60 years ago. The community got fragmented. It's a bad thing. Yes, you can buy a box that translates from one to another. I'd rather not. I'd rather stick with the free software. But again, your hobby time, your money, you have every right to do what you choose and what you think is fun. I prefer to stick with this kind of thing for those reasons. And so if you go to m17project.org, you can learn more about what they're doing. Uh, they have a Discord server where they talk about a lot of things. I believe they are at Hamvention, so you can talk to those folks directly. They're doing some very, very cool stuff. I encourage you to go learn more. Um, downloads. Honestly, I wouldn't care if 10 people downloaded it or a million. I'm going to create it anyway, because to me it's fun. I set my laptop up this way. I wanted to share that with people, as I mentioned before. So in the beginning, I've been doing this since, uh, what, 2008, 2010? 2011, May 2011 was the first version. Version 8. The first seven versions were not worthy, in my opinion. So version 8 went out the door. I'm up to version 25 alpha, but there were several versions of 24 and whatnot. I think there have been about 35 total releases since 2011. Every six months to a year, I come out with a new one, which is largely a refresh. But every now and again, Ubuntu has a major release, and I need to keep up with that so that you all have the latest and greatest stuff. And you can see how the download count has skyrocketed over the years, and I'm thrilled to see that. Now, I actually think it's two or three people that have bad download links, and they just keep trying which I give them credit for that, right? But uh, again, thank you all for your support. I appreciate that. Uh, and as I mentioned, as I checked last night, there were 630 downloads of the latest version. It's only been out for two weeks. So that's, that's boding well. It tends to average about 1,000 downloads a month. And uh, so 250 a week. I'm happy with that. I know there's software that does that in an hour. That's okay, that's not the point. The point is the quality of it and getting it into your hands so that you can further enhance your enjoyment of the ham radio hobby. Um, last year, uh, March 2022, I was extraordinarily surprised and pleased when the SourceForge people sent me an email and said, congratulations on 100,000 downloads. I didn't do all that. You all did that. Thank you very much. I sincerely appreciate that. And if you want to read the article that was written by my local section about that, there's a link here for that, and you can read that. If anybody wants my slides, send me an email. My call sign at the league, I will be very happy to share the slides with you. If you have a group that has a connection via Zoom and you'd like me to give a talk to your group, I'd be very happy to do that. If you're within an hour's drive of my house, I'll come visit you if you want me to. I'd love to just help spread the word of this to people. Um, go to SourceForge, search for my call sign. There's other ham radio programs on there that I've put out there for you. Uh, the Microfox program, FL MoxGen, and so on and so forth. And uh, you can download those at that place. Related videos. Uh, the Rat Pack folks, Radio Amateur Training, Planning, and Activities Committee. They meet virtually. I'm not sure even where in the country they're located. They have a large library of talks that people have given to them uh, via web conferences. Uh, I was asked to join them one evening and give them a talk. So if your friends couldn't be here today, after you yell at them for that, send them to this link so they can watch the talk and learn something about Ham Radio Linux. Uh, there was also a gentleman on YouTube, he refers to himself as the old tech guy, Kevin, KB9RLW, if he's here, thank you. Uh, if not, I'll meet him later if he's here. Um, he did what I thought was a very fair review of the software, and uh, 
warts and all. He showed it right there, so feel free to take a look at that. And that is my very last slide. I will have time for perhaps one or two questions, and then I'm happy to talk to people outside of the building. I want to bail out so the next presenter can take over. Uh, thank you very much for the time. Uh, this has been a heck of a thrill for me. I've never been here before. Let me take one or two.